On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Sharita Williams, who was 16 years old when she was murdered in Pensacola, New Jersey, on November 28, 2003. That evening, Sharita left home to get her nails done. But when she left the salon that evening, she never returned home. Less than 24 hours after she was last seen, Sharita's body was found near a bridge. She had been sexually assaulted before being murdered. When Sharita was killed, investigators working the case hoped that they would find her killer quickly. But five years would go by before a suspect emerged and Sharita's killer was finally brought to justice. This is Sharita's story. In the fall of 2003, Sharita Williams and I were both 16-year-old high school juniors. But Sharita's journey was tragically cut short that year. Her life brutally taken away in a senseless act of violence. She will forever be 16. Her potential and future stolen from her. Telling stories like Sharita's is difficult because it forces me to confront the harsh reality that her fate could have been mine or any of ours. She was not just a statistic. She was a vibrant girl with dreams and aspirations, just like all of us at that age. Sharita was born on October 1st, 1987 to Harry and Wilma Williams. She had two siblings, an older sister named Sabrina and a younger brother named John. She was affectionately called Sunshine by her friends and family because they said she had the ability to light up any room she came into. Described as a beautiful, loving, outgoing person, Sharita was someone people just gravitated towards. In school, she was an excellent student who was serious about her schoolwork and her grades. Her family said that she was interested in photography, but she wanted to be a social worker so that she could be in a position to help people in need. When she wasn't at school or studying, Sharita loved dancing and listening to music, and she loved spending time with her family, whether they were at church or watching movies at home. At church, Sharita was a member of the youth group, which she participated in and participated in various activities. Sharita and her family lived in Pensacola, New Jersey, located in Camden County, which is about 20 minutes from Philadelphia. In 2001, Sharita began attending Pensacola High School. As someone who had always done well in school, nothing had changed for her, and she remained a diligent student. And the sunshine that she carried with her quickly made her popular among the other students. As Sharita got closer to graduation, she began making plans to attend college and was looking forward to pursuing her dreams of becoming a social worker. As her junior year began at Pensacola High in the fall of 2003, life for Sharita, by all accounts, was good. She had been babysitting to earn some extra money and she even had a boyfriend. On October 1st, Sharita turned 16 and while she and her family celebrated that milestone, they had no way to know that it would be the last birthday that they spent with her. On November 28th, 2003, the day after Thanksgiving, Sharita made plans with her girlfriend to go get their nails and eyebrows done at a nearby nail salon. Hollywood Nails, the salon that she was planning to go to, was only a few blocks from where she lived, and so Sharita could walk. Her friend, who had been at work, was planning to meet her at the salon. And so sometime after 5 p.m., Sharita's mother, Wilma, said that her daughter left their home. Wilma said that she told Sharita not to be out by herself, but her daughter reassured her that she was going to be meeting her friend. Once at the salon, Sharita sat down to get her nails done, but her friend that was supposed to meet her never showed up. Now, according to reporting by the Philadelphia Inquirer, Sharita's girlfriend ended up getting off at the wrong bus stop, and so she never arrived to meet her there. Now, from what I could gather from this story, Sharita did not have a cell phone, and so it's not clear if she ever communicated with her friend. But nonetheless, Sharita stayed and got her nails and eyebrows done, and then left the salon shortly before 6.30 p.m. At about 6.30 p.m., 
Sharita decided to go and visit her boyfriend, who lived not too far from the salon near 36th Street. When Sharita arrived at his house, his mother, who allegedly didn't like her very much, answered the door. Now, according to reports, when Sharita got there, his mother told her that he was asleep and then did not invite her to come inside. Sharita left and walked to a nearby payphone. Apparently, the encounter with her boyfriend's mother had upset her, and so she stopped by a payphone to call him and tell him about it. It's not clear whether or not Sharita ever spoke to her boyfriend that night, however. And back at her house, Sharita's parents waited for her to come home. When they last saw her, she said that she would be back in a few hours, but that night, Sharita did not return home. Her mom said that when her daughter did not come back that night, that they were not immediately concerned. The friend that she said she was going to the nail salon with lived down the street, and she would often go to her house. They figured Sharita must have gone there and, after they were done, had fallen asleep. Now, when her parents woke up the next morning, on November 29th, they fully expected to see or at least hear from Sharita, but she did not contact them, and she had yet to return home. Luma, who had at that point was becoming concerned, called Sharita's friend, and when she did, everything changed. Sharita's friend told her mom that they had not met the night before. She explained that she had gotten off at the wrong stop, and so she had not been with Sharita, and she had no idea where she was. At that moment, Luma knew that something was wrong. If Sharita wasn't with her friend, then where could she be? After speaking to the girlfriend that Sharita was supposed to meet, Wilma and Harry called around to Sharita's other friends to see if anyone had seen or spoken to her, but no one had any idea where Sharita was. However, Wilma did get a tip from one friend that Sharita was seen near 35th Street the night before. Wilma knew that Sharita's boyfriend lived near the area, not far from the new New Jersey transit station and the 36th Street Bridge. And after calling around, Sharita's parents decided to get in their car and try looking for their daughter. Wilma told the Philadelphia Inquirer that when she was told her daughter was seen near the 36th Street Bridge, she feared that maybe she had gotten hit by a car after leaving her boyfriend's house and was somehow thrown over the bridge and out of sight. It was a terrifying thought, but Sharita's parents needed to find out where she was. At around 10.30 a.m., Wilma and Harry drove to the 36th Street Bridge, which was located less than two miles from where they lived. They drove across and looked for any signs of their daughter or, or any signs that there was an accident, but they didn't find anything. After driving around and finding no signs of her, Sharita's parents knew it was time to call the police to report their daughter missing. At around noon on November 29th, they contacted the Pensalkin police to file a missing person report. Not surprisingly, Harry said that police suggested that Sharita was a runaway. But the Williams knew their daughter, and they knew that she had not run away. Police took the report, and Harry and Wilma waited for someone to call them. But Wilma's intuition was telling her that something bad had happened. She told her husband that she was going back to the bridge. Her instincts were telling her that she needed to go back there. And so at around 2.30 p.m., Wilma arrived back at the 36th Street Bridge. This time, when she drove over the bridge, she saw something. Quote, when I looked toward the column, I saw somebody, but it didn't look like Sharita, she told the Philadelphia Inquirer. Wilma wasn't sure who she had found, but she was too afraid to look closer, and so she decided to call the police. Shortly before 3 p.m., Pensalkin police arrived at the 36th Street Bridge. And once police got closer, they confirmed that it was the body of a teen girl. She was lying face up, her shirt ripped open, and her pants unbuttoned. Her hands were tied behind her back. The girl fit Sharita's description, but when a purse with an ID was found nearby, police were able to confirm that Sharita had been found. 
Her underwear was ripped off, leaving marks around her waist, and the underwear was found discarded near her body. Once investigators arrived on the scene, it was clear to them that this murder was more likely than not sexually motivated. Around her neck, investigators found a do-rag and inside her mouth, two plastic bags from models that had been stuffed inside. Next to her body, they found a single penny and a receipt for a black shirt purchased at models. The timestamp on the receipt was 4.28 p.m. on November 28th. The models where the purchase was made was located at the Cherry Hill Mall in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is about 10 minutes from Pensalkin. After Sharita's body was found, the investigation into who killed her began. Once her ID was confirmed, Wilma and Harry were notified that the person she had found near the bridge was their daughter. The news was unimaginable, and they were devastated. They only found solace in knowing that she at least had been found. Quote, it's good to know where she is. It would have killed me if we didn't find her, Wilma told the Inquirer. She said that she believes that if she had not gone out and looked for her daughter, it may have been months before she was found. Less than 24 hours after Wilma and Harry last saw their daughter, she was dead, brutally murdered. The news of Sharita's murder spread quickly to her family and friends and the community, and the details about what happened to her sent shockwaves and fear throughout Pensalkin. How could someone rape and brutally murder a 16-year-old girl? Now, while investigators began collecting evidence and information, they were hopeful that they would find Sharita's killer quickly before he could hurt anyone else. But before they could, this case would go cold, and five long years would go by before justice would be served. On November 28th, 2003, 16-year-old Charita Williams left her home to get her nails done. Less than 24 hours later, her body was found near a bridge, less than two miles from her home. Once Sharita's body was found near the 36th Street Bridge in Pensacola, New Jersey, detectives assigned to the case began trying to piece together what had happened to her. Evidence collected at the scene included a receipt from Models, a do-rag, and a penny, and all of those items were sent to the lab to be tested. Investigators hoped to be able to get fingerprints off of the receipt. While they waited for the results to come back, Detectives began talking to Sharita's parents to find out about her whereabouts the day she was last seen. They were also curious about why Wilma had gone to the bridge. And so, when they spoke to Sharita's parents, they recalled her last day, telling detectives about her trip to the nail salon and how she was supposed to meet her girlfriend, who didn't show up. When asked about the bridge... Wilma told detectives that she had been told that Sharita was seen near 35th Street and that one of her friends told her that Sharita was afraid to cross the 36th Street Bridge. Her motherly intuition had brought her there, and sadly, she was right. After speaking to her parents, detectives went to the Hollywood Nail Salon to see if Sharita had been there and what time she left. The women at the salon confirmed that Sharita had been there on Friday evening, and surveillance from inside the salon captured her on camera getting her eyebrows done at around 6.05 p.m. When she left the salon, she was alone. Detectives now at least knew that Sharita had arrived at the nail salon, giving them a starting point for their timeline, but they now needed to know where she had gone next. Without cell phone records or any other surveillance footage, Detectives were going to need witnesses. One of the next people that they talked to was Sharita's friend, the one who mentioned the 36th Street Bridge to her parents. When investigators spoke to her, they asked her why she thought Sharita was near the bridge, and she explained that it was really just a hunch. And since she knew that Sharita's boyfriend lived near there, when Wilma and Harry called looking for her, she thought that Sharita may have gone to his house. Now, once detectives learned about the boyfriend and how close he lived to the crime scene, 
they needed to speak to him next. After making contact with the boyfriend, they sat down with him and his mother. He told detectives that Sharita had been at his house, but that he did not see her. His mother confirmed that Sharita was there that evening and that she knocked on the door, but she did not let her in. She also admitted that she did not like Sharita very much. The boyfriend then told detectives that after Sharita left, she began calling him from a payphone. He said she was angry about what his mother had said to her, and he said he got about 15 calls from Sharita that evening. After speaking to the boyfriend and his mom, they asked him to come into the police station to take a lie detector test, which he agreed to and ultimately passed, and he was ruled out as a suspect. As part of their investigation, investigators said they spoke to dozens of people and got DNA samples from males who were acquainted with Sharita. An autopsy had determined that she had been sexually assaulted and had died from asphyxiation. Semen was collected from her genes so that it could be compared to samples that they had obtained. And then detectives began turning their attention to the evidence found at the scene. Unfortunately, There were no fingerprints found on the receipt from Models or the penny, and although there were hair fibers found inside the do-rag, the crime lab was backed up and so the results were being delayed. Detectives went to the Models where the shirt was purchased in hopes that they could get surveillance footage of their suspect, but unfortunately, the cameras that pointed to the register inside the store were not working the day the purchase was made. Detectives tried pulling credit card receipts for that day to see if they could identify a suspect. They even contacted shoppers from the store that day whose receipts were stamped around the same time to see if they could provide a description, but no one had any information. A few months after Sharita's murder, the crime lab had results of the semen collected from Sharita's genes. The DNA was tested against samples that investigators had collected during their investigation, but none of the samples had matched. They tried running the DNA through CODIS, the national DNA database, but there was no match for the suspect. After what started off as promising evidence turned up nothing, Sharita's case began to go cold. Investigators had exhausted all of their leads, and the DNA that they had had no match. They were going to have to wait to see if, sadly, their killer struck again. In the meantime, Sharita's family was determined to keep her memory alive and find her killer. Her dad, Harry, kept in constant contact with detectives about his daughter's case, demanding meetings for updates. The Williams were not going to allow the police to put their daughter's case on the back burner. In the years that followed, Sharita's family began holding marches on the bridge where her body was found. It became an annual tradition as they attempted to keep her story in the public eye. And four years after Sharita was murdered, investigators would finally get a break in this case. When the DNA found on Sharita's body was entered into CODIS at first, there was no match. But in 2007, they got a hit. The DNA found on Sharita matched a man named Warren Dixon, who was 23 years old at the time. Dixon was not someone who detectives working the case were familiar with. His name had not come up during their investigation, and so they had no idea who he was. But He had recently been arrested and convicted on a drug charge, and because of that, his DNA was entered into the system. Detectives working Sharita's case located Dixon and went to his probation officer, where they met him and brought him in to be questioned. Dixon told police that he did know Sharita. He said that he had gone to Pensacola High School. He told them that he had transferred there in 2003 from Camden High and that he had class with one of Sharita's friends. He then claimed that he and Sharita had consensual sex and that he knew nothing about her murder except for what he had seen on the news. But the investigators did not believe him. 
They believed that the story about the consensual sex was his way of explaining why his DNA was on the victim. Detectives had learned that shortly after the murder, Dixon dropped out of high school and moved to Pennsylvania. They also discovered that he lived a few blocks from where the crime took place. Dixon, however, continued to deny that he had anything to do with Sharita's murder, but detectives were sure that they had found their man. However, they needed more evidence to arrest him. The do-rag that was found around Sharita's neck had fibers collected from it, and so detectives wanted to get a hair sample from Dixon so that they could link it to the evidence found at the scene itself. They knew that it would be their smoking gun if they could. It took a month for the warrant to collect Dixon's hair sample to be approved. And when it was, he was brought into the prosecutor's office to have the sample taken. Investigators said that while at the office, Dixon seemed to be very interested in the details of the case. And the detectives told the Philadelphia Inquirer that Dixon asked them what would happen if he had done this and it was an accident. Would he still have to go to jail? Detectives believed that Dixon was ready to confess to what he had done, but he ended up ending the interview suddenly. In January 2009, the DNA results from the do-rag finally came back, but they were not a match. However, prosecutors believed that the detectives had collected enough evidence to arrest Dixon for Sharita's murder. Detectives believe that Dixon saw Sharita while he was on his way home from the mall and that she rejected his advances and so he attacked her, raping her and then strangling her to death. They don't really know why he stuffed the plastic bags in her mouth. But when Sharita's parents were notified of their arrest, they had a million questions. They had no idea who Warren Dixon was and They did not believe that Sharita knew who he was either. They could not understand why he would want to kill their daughter when it seems like he barely even knew her. Quote, he must have been a psycho. Why he would choose Sharita, or if he was obsessed with Sharita, whatever reasons, we don't know, but he chose her, Wilma told the local news. In March 2011, Warren Dixon pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter and attempted aggravated sexual assault. And in June 2011, he received a 20-year sentence. He is currently serving his sentence at a New Jersey state prison and will be eligible for parole on January 30th, 2026. Upon his release, he will be required to register as a sex offender. It took years for the person who killed Charita to be caught and put behind bars. And although her family was satisfied with the outcome because it meant that he could not hurt anyone else, it did not ease the pain that they continued to live with. There is no reason why this happened to Sharita. She had just gone out on a Friday night to get her nails done. She was supposed to come back home. It's hard to imagine why Warren Dixon, a teen himself, would kill a girl he barely knew and how at such a young age, he could commit such a brutal, heinous act. But he will get out of jail. He will get to live out the rest of his life. Something he stole from Sharita for absolutely no reason. For her family, the loss of their beloved daughter and sister and friend will always be a void in their lives. They find comfort in keeping her name and story alive because they don't want people to ever forget her. May Sherita Williams rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads. Threads.